So, there's been a lot of massive developments in Boruto recently. Everything from how the Rasengan Uzuhiko works to the anatomy of the Shinju has now been revealed as of chapter 12 of the manga. And while we've been looking back at this chapter and theorizing about possible futures that the information given to us in this chapter could create, I feel as though this chapter, while it did open the door for infinite possibilities moving forward, has also possibly answered some of the longest standing questions in Naruto history. See, because while yes, it's incredible that we now know that the Shinju have a soul core that can either be returned to the person who was turned into a tree or even possibly destroyed. It's crazy that for some reason Kashin Koji knows all this information, even though Shinju seem to be a relatively new phenomenon. And it's awesome that we got even the smallest bit of information about how Rasengan Uzuhiko works. But what if instead of using that information to answer how Boruto may end, we use that information to answer long standing, never answered questions like what was going on with Hashirama? See, because while the exposition given to us about the Shinju and how Rasengan Uzuhiko works seemed to just be building up the lore into Blue Vortex, if you actually objectively look at how Rasengan Uzuhiko and the Shinju work, oddly enough, the majority of the exposition we've been given about those two very separate topics, at least so far as we know, all line up with who Hashirama was as a person and what his abilities were. But a lot of you are probably wondering, Nick, what are you possibly driving at here? Well, Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in a long time, I want to take a step backwards today. I don't want to theorize about what could be. Instead, I want to theorize about what was. Because I think the information given to us in Two Blue Vortex up until this point may not only shed new light on the conversation revolving around what kind of sage Hashirama was, but could also simply shed light on what kind of being he was. Because today, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking Hashirama was a Shinju. But before we get to putting our tinfoil hats on, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you're feeling particularly generous and you love my crackpot theories, go ahead and follow my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime and manga. Or if you want to see me try to bring real-life challenges to the anime world, go ahead and follow my brand new project that I created with Stephen He, Chris Barnett, and Danny Mata called Anime IRL. Or if you just want to hear me talk anime and manga, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, I Talk is Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. But before before we get into all that today, we gotta to talk about a brand new sponsor to the page. Fabletics! Listen, Fabletics has been a brand that I've been riding with for a long time, so them sponsoring the page is actually kind of sick. As you all know, on this channel, I have a somewhat small aversion to sleeves, and therefore I'm very frequently wearing workout clothes of some regard when filming my videos. And while I've tried a bunch of different athletic clothing brands, I haven't found one that I like as much as Fabletics. See, the fit and the feel of Fabletic clothing is second to none. Whether it's the sweat wicking material they make their shirts out of, the zip pockets they include, on both their shorts and pants, which makes them absolutely essential for airplane travel days. I literally don't fly without my Fabletics pants on. And the convenience runs side by side with look because I look good in my Fabletics clothes. And thus, whether it's sitting in this chair and talking to you about anime or hitting the gym, Fabletics always has to be covered. But Fabletics is a lot more than just make great clothes. They also make those great clothes incredibly affordable through a program known as their VIP program. See, simply by signing up for the VIP program, you get 70% off the whole Fabletics website. And as a VIP member, you get 50% off the Fabletics website any single time you want. On top of that, each month your membership gives you access to a credit that allows you to either spend up to $100 on a singular product or a free two-piece outfit. Yes, that's right. Simply by being a member, every single month you'll get a credit that allows you to get one item from the shop up to $100 or a two-piece outfit. And the membership is flexible. You can skip any month you want to between the first and the fifth of that month without being charged. On top of that, VIP perks include things like monthly drops, early access to new styles, Styles, VIP only sales, and free fit app membership. So, what are you guys waiting for? Click the link in my description to become a VIP over at Fabletics today to get 70% off the whole store. And you and me can be twinsies. So, listen, I'm aware the prospect of Hashirama being a Shinju sounds completely and utterly insane. A lot of you are probably saying that not only did Claw Grimes not exist in Hashirama's era, but even if Claw Grimes did exist in Hashirama's era, Code wouldn't have been around to augment them. And thus, even if they bit somebody and turned them into a divine tree, they wouldn't have spawned a Shinju. And you're right. Claw Grimes, Code, Superior Claw Grimes all didn't exist in Hashirama's time period. So far as we know. 
However, I'd like to provide to you all of the relatively compelling information that I've compiled that draws a rather clear line between Hashirama and the Shinjin. And at the end of the video, we'll draw a conclusion to see as to whether or not it could definitively be a possibility that Hashirama is in fact the Shinjin. So while I will admit the theory does sound crackpot, Give me a second. See, the last few chapters of Two Blue Vortex have given us a couple of key exposition points about the Shinju. More specifically, how the Shinju operate and how they fight and how they recover. And all of those things seem to tie back to the divine trait, all in differing capacities. See, when it comes to offensive abilities, it appears as though the Shinju have the ability to use wood release. This is shown by the fact that Jura tried to use a tree to swallow up Himawari and the fact that he impaled the wall guards at Konoha with three individual branches of a giant tree and he did the same thing to Inogen. In fact, pretty much from the introduction of the Shinju, it's been made incredibly clear that they were all able to use wood release. As when Boruto found himself face to face with the Shinju in the first couple of chapters of Two Blue Vortex, he is also swallowed up and held still by wood release. And thus, as wood release is something that we've attributed to Hashirama for as long as Naruto has existed as a universe, it's hard to see other people using wood release and not try and draw a clear line to Hashirama. However, that's not the only way that the Shinju draw their power from the divine tree because as we saw in chapter 12 of two blue vortex when hidari was injured by boruto's rasengan he had to retreat into a claw mark that brought him back to the shinju headquarters where apparently some kind of sentient divine tree healed his lost arm and thus not only do the shinju appear to channel a lot of their offensive might through wood release but they also seem to channel their healing through wood release and ironically if there's two things that hashirama is known for it's his healing factor and his wood release. And while it is still technically unclear as to whether or not what the Shinju use is actually wood release or somehow tied to the divine tree, but I would argue that we could have the exact same conversation for Hashirama. See, because if uh, hypothetically the Shinju are simply summoning the roots of the divine tree to channel their wood release, who's to say that Hashirama wasn't doing the same? It's never explicitly stated, oh, this is just standard wood. And at the end of the day, it wouldn't necessarily matter because of the constitution of earth. See, Naruto's earth has been through a couple of very very interesting events however by far and away the most interesting events that the naruto globe has ever been through is the infinite tsukiyomi it was hit with twice once when kakia first consumed the chakra fruit that she found on the divine tree when she descended down to earth and a second time during the fourth great shinobi world war and rather interestingly in both of these scenarios different divine trees reached their roots through the entirety of earth to grab up every living being yes that's right on at least two separate occasions a divine tree has grown its roots through the entirety of earth and while we don't know for certain whether or not this happens every time a divine tree sprouts on a new planet because it was kakia or Kaguya's will that enacted both of these infinite Tsukiyomi, and because Kaguya was trying to build an army of white Zetsu to battle back against the Otsutsuki, she needed to turn the entirety, or at least the majority, of humankind into white Zetsu. And thus, as to whether or not the Shinju are channeling the Divine Tree's roots, or simply just the roots of close-by trees, may not necessarily matter, because the roots of the Divine Tree exist all over the globe. And thus, a legitimate argument can be made that whenever Hashirama was using his wood release, he was also just using the roots of the divine tree. But for those of you screaming, but Nick Hashirama existed before the era of the fourth great shinobi world war. Well, that doesn't matter because Kagi uses infinite Tsukiyomi on the entirety of humanity 1,000 years before Hashirama was even alive. Tie that into the fact that the Shinju seem to have a living and somewhat sentient divine tree, probably on earth. That is more likely than not the divine tree that Kagi plucked the chakra fruit from thousands of years ago. And that means that the divine tree that reached its roots through the entirety of the earth is still alive. And thus its roots wouldn't have withered up and snapped and rescinded back to the tree, which would mean that there's a fair possibility that those roots would still exist worldwide. But the Shinju using wood release and having the ability to be healed by a sentient divine trees and all that we've learned about them recently. We've also learned that the only way to destroy them is to gather their soul thorn and either return it to the person who was bitten by the claw grime or destroy it. We've also learned through a conversation that Jura was having with Himawari that the Shinju, or at least Jura, actively compare themselves to the Bijou. As when Jura was battling against Himawari, he says, and I quote, hmm, what an astounding healing power, far beyond human origin Jura level, something almost like what 
we Bijou possess. And thus, while the Shinju are walking divine trees of sort, they also actively compare themselves to the Bijou or the tailed beasts. And this makes sense because by and large, they all tie their roots back to the ten tails, just like all the nine tailed beasts, as all of their chakra signatures started from a claw grind that was split off from the juvenile ten tails. And Jura himself may actually just be that juvenile ten tails. And thus, the Shinju, in essence, harness the power of the tailed beasts. But not like the nine that we know. They harness the power of the the juvenile ten tails. And it's actually in this line of logic that we're able to deduce why the Shinju do in fact have wood release. See, because while wood release is often attributed to Hashirama, Hashirama is not the creator of wood release. The Ten Tails is. See, as we all know from our favorite pincushion, Neji, Wood Release is very much an ability within the capabilities of the Ten Tails, as the Ten Tails showed us by generating wood spikes on its tails and firing them at the Shinobi Alliance. And since the Ten Tails has existed for thousands of years longer than Hashirama, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that Hashirama was not the creator of Wood Release, but was instead just using an ability known to the Ten Tails. And as the Ten Tails and Divine Trees in the Naruto universe are pretty much the same thing, just minus one of the ingredients of a lower ranking Otsutsuki, and if you're the Shinju and you draw your power from the Ten Tails, since you are kind of walking divine trees, then it would stand to reason that you would be able to use the abilities of the Ten Tail of which you came from wood release and thus it's no stretch in logic to say that any person who's able to use wood release in the naruto universe is kind of tapping into the power of the ten tails and rather ironically while many have scratched their heads at the idea that moeki is important enough to the story to be selected as one of the shinju people also scratch their head at the idea that moeki a character who had no real significance in naruto and shippuden was the first character outside of hashirama to naturally acquire wood release see because well yes well it's not nearly as deadly or as powerful as hashirama would release, Moegi, by using yin yang release and combining water and earth release, can use a very weakened version of wood release. And thus, if the idea that Moegi was somehow important enough to be chosen as one of the four antagonist Shinju in this arc perplexes you, I reckon at some point it'll be revealed that the reason that she was one of the people chosen is because, in terms of connection to the Ten Tails, she had one of the greatest of all people alive. That's if, you know, Kishimoto ever finds the time to put her Shinju in the story. Or in Bug, been real no-shows. But if we're going through with this line of logic and we're assuming that wood release is inherently tied to the divine tree and ten tails, how and why did Hashirama have it? Well, Hashirama has as prominent a case to be connected to a ten tails as basically anybody in human history in the Naruto world. Hashirama was, after all, an Asura reincarnation, aka a reincarnation of the son of Hagoromo, who was the son of Kakia, who in herself was basically a Ten Tails. And thus, if anybody was going to be able to tap into the power of the Divine Tree and figure out wood release, Hashirama's as good a candidate as literally anybody. Kind of like how Himawari, as a third generation Kuramajin Cherokee, is the best ever Kuramajin Cherokee because she got the genetic role of the dice. See, while it's highly likely that the majority of of the Asura reincarnations between Asura's death and Hashirama's life popped up in either the Senju or Uzumaki clans, there's really no guarantee to prove that. On top of this, while we do know that Uzumaki and the Senju clans were the most closely descended from Asura, the time between Asura and Hashirama's lives is thousands of years. Asura's progeny line is split between millions of people by the time that Hashirama is alive. And thus, Hashirama as a full-blooded Senju and an Asura reincarnation would have a much better shot at tapping into the power of possibly Kaguya than presumably the majority of Asura's reincarnations. On top of that, we don't know for certain as to whether or not any of Asura's reincarnations prior to Hashirama had wood release. But if we are moving forward with the ideology that Hashirama did in fact glean his powers from his connection to Kaguya, the Ten Tails, and the Divine Tree, then it answers a lot of the lingering questions we have about wood release. See, one of the oddest things about wood release is the fact that it's so effective against tailed beasts. See, while the general prognosis as to why wood release is so powerful against tailed beasts is that wood release uses natural objects against entities created strictly from nature energy and therefore when the two come into contact with each other the nature energy of the tailed beast flows back into the wood it's never necessarily explained in any great detail as to why this is basically the only explanation we get as to why wood release is so effective against tailed beasts is because wood release has chakra absorption abilities which is kind of odd when you think about it. See, why would Wood Release have chakra absorption abilities in the first place? Here you could go with the idea that, oh, trees are always soaking in energy to grow bigger and stronger and wood is porous, but that's boring and far-fetched. 
However, if you're sticking with our line of logic here and implying that the roots that are being controlled by wood release are actually the roots of a divine tree that sprouted across the globe centuries ago, the idea that wood release would have chakra absorption abilities makes a lot more sense. Because inherently, that's exactly what the roots of the divine tree are supposed to do, absorb chakra. See, whether or not the roots of the divine tree are trying to catch people and put them in pods and turn them into white setsu, or just burrowing into a globe to absorb all the energy out of the globe to create a chakra fruit, when it comes down to it, the soul the whole purpose of the divine tree, and especially its roots, is the absorption of chakra, as the roots are trying to bring the chakra that it's absorbing back to the tree to create a more powerful chakra fruit. And thus, in essence, this would explain why wood release is so incredibly powerful against tailed beasts. Because if you use wood release against a tailed beast, you're essentially using the power of the ten tails against tailed beast chakra. You are using the only source of energy greater than the energy of the nine tailed beasts, the ten tails, against the nine tailed beasts. And thus, in essence, every time you're using wood release against a tailed beast you're kind of operating like the ghetto statue you're sapping the energy of a split up ten tails back to an original source and thus the explanation as to why hashirama's god gates were able to hold down something like the ten tails is because hashirama in essence was using the power of the ten tails against the ten tails but wood release isn't the only thing that hashirama has in common with the shinju because he also has a healing factor a healing factor that we rather conveniently have never seen him use see while we understand that Hashirama had an incredible healing factor and that he didn't have to weave hand signs to heal, we never once saw him get so grievously injured that he needed to use it. And thus, how Hashirama's healing factor functions is by and large a mystery to us. And while it's mostly assumed that Hashirama's healing factor functions a bit like Tsunade or Sakura's when they use mitotic regeneration without the hand seals or the strength of a hundred seal, we don't know this. The only reason that we come to this conclusion is because Maduro, when he sees Tsunade use the strength of a hundred seal in mitotic regeneration, he says, surely you're trying to imitate Hashirama's healing factor, but Hashirama was the perfect ninja. His chakra and life force were so abundant that he didn't even need to weave hand seals in order to heal grievous injuries. And thus, we just kind of assume that whenever Hashirama was injured, he would just heal. But like I said, we don't know this. Hashirama healing from an injury has never once been shown to us. And therefore, there's an equal possibility that Hashirama's healing factor works in the way that we think it does. That is, that he just heals without doing a hand sign, and that Hashirama's healing factor works in the way that we saw it work on Hidari. That's to say that the roots of some sentient divine tree reached up and funneled their power into Hashirama in order to make sure that any wound that he sustained closed up. We can't necessarily say for certain. It's also important to note that we've technically never seen he Hidari use wood release. We've seen Jura and Moegi use it, but never Hidari. So there's also a possibility that Hidari can't use wood release, but if he could use wood release, he could use that wood release to heal him without slipping into a claw mark and going back to the Shinju base. And therefore, as to whether or not Hashirama's wounds just closed or he used the roots that he controlled with his wood release to close his wounds, we can't necessarily say. All we know is that he wouldn't have to weave hand seals to do it. And rather appropriately, Hidari doesn't weave a singular hand seal to have the the sentient divine tree heal his arm injury shoulder injury he lost his arm and thus the one thing that we do know about Hashirama's healing factor appears to align with how Hidari healed so let's sit down and have a conversation about Hashirama and what he accomplished and what his possible motives would have been for accomplishing those things pretty much the most important thing that Hashirama is known for outside of the foundation of Konoha is the capturing of all nine tailed beasts and a lot of you probably think you know why Hashirama did that I mean he saw Madara use Kurama's massive power in battle against him and decided oh, I think I should probably catch as many of these as possible to make sure that nobody else does that. And that's fair. That is kind of what he does. And that is kind of why he does it. Hashirama identifies the threat that tailed beasts roaming about presents, especially if somebody like Madara is able to control them, and decides to round them all up. However, he doesn't hold on to the tailed beasts for long. In fact, he tries to give all of them away to his neighboring villages to avoid war, which he doesn't accomplish. And well, obviously Hashirama did this because he believed in the best in people. If Hashirama was well and truly trying to capture the tailed beast to avoid them being used by hostile entities against Konoha and himself, turning around and freely giving them to the people who were already posturing to start a war against Konoha in the first place wasn't a great idea. And sure, you could mark that up to Hashirama being an idiot. I know I do. What if Hashirama actually accomplished everything he needed from the tailed beast after capturing them and therefore had no real necessity to hold on to them any longer? See, there is 
reason that we know the Hashiram was able to capture the Nine-Tailed Beast with such incredible ease is because of his Wood Release and how strong it is against Tailed Beasts. And we've already established the fact that the reason that Wood Release is so strong against Tailed Beasts is because of the Chakra Absorption ability of Wood Release. But where is that Chakra being absorbed to? See, Chakra, outside of things like Baryon Mode, is never destroyed. It's energy. And while Chakra isn't technically destroyed in Baryon Mode, you get what I mean. But this Chakra that's being absorbed by Tailed Beasts, who are simply being weakened by coming into contact with Wood Release, has to go somewhere. And rather ironically, you know who's always riding their Wood Release with two feet down on it? Hashirama. So what if in actuality, the reason that Hashirama was willing to give away all the Tailed Beasts wasn't because he believed the best out of all the other villages, but because he had already siphoned off as much energy as he could ever possibly need from all the Tailed Beasts that he collected. I mean, think about it. We know from Ginkaku and Kinkaku that simply bathing in Kurama's chakra and consuming a part of him allowed both of them to be in Jinchuriki of Kurama up to a version 2 Jinchuriki cloak for the rest of their lives. And as Kinkaku and Ginkaku were undoubtedly involved in dozens of highly important fights, it's no doubt that they used a ton of Kurama's chakra, as is very well evidenced by the fact that Kinkaku, or Kinkaku, I can't remember which one gets absorbed second, was able to use a version 2 Jinjerki cloak with complete control over their motivations, implying that they had a fair amount of expertise using this form. But that seems to show that simply the consumption of chakra from a tailed beast is enough to make you a pseudo Jinjerki, so long as you have the composition and the strength to maintain that power. So if hypothetically Hashirama were to go out and capture eight of the nine tailed beasts, the Hidden Sand Village already had Chukaku, and while in the process of capturing these tailed beasts, siphoned off their energy directly into himself, he would, for all intents and purposes, basically become a pseudo Ten Tails Jinchuriki. But he wouldn't be a Jinchuriki, because the ego of all of these tailed beasts wouldn't be implemented inside of him. These tailed beasts aren't sealed inside of them. Kind of like how Samihata consumes Chakra and uses it to power up, Hashirama in this circumstance would be tapping into the power of all the tailed beasts that he's controlled. And thus Hashirama, without technically being a Jinchuriki would be powered by the Ten Tails. Kind of like the Shinju. And this is corroborated by a point that I've already kind of hinted at, where whenever Hashirama activated his Sage Mode, which is one of the biggest question marks in the entirety of Naruto history, he would remain entirely still, with his two feet planted on whatever wooden construct he was controlling. Now, rather interestingly, this sounds somewhat similar to Rasengan Uzuhiko, which, while it doesn't necessarily require Boruto to be still, like the collection of Nature Chakra, does require that he have two feet on the ground. Now, Hashirama collecting Nature Chakra in this way is never made a huge amount of sense to me because the only other frame of reference we have for the collection of nature chakra is naruto who sits down with his hands together to collect nature chakra however we now have a different reference for the collection of energy from the planet and that separate example is Boruto, who collects energy by keeping his two feet planted on the ground. And thus I ask the question, what if the reason that Hashirama always needed to stand on his wooden constructs was so that he could sap the energy from the divine tree roots he was using? And therefore, in actuality, the reason that we don't know what kind of sage Hashirama is, is because he wasn't. The markings on Hashirama's face when he activates his Sage Mode have always been a massive talking point in the Naruto community and on this channel, because objectively they don't look like anybody else's markings that they get when they activate their Sage Mode. And the biggest question mark resides in the circle that appears on Hashirama's forehead. And what we've talked about on this channel about how the symbol is tied to the ancient Egyptian drawings of the sun, and how the symbols that appear on Hashirama's face are eerily similar to the Eye of Ra, or possibly to the stripes that run along the side of Lady Katsu, what if in actuality the circle that appears on Hashirama's head is much simpler than all of that? What if in actuality it's just supposed to represent an eye? I mean, it's a circle with a dot in the middle of his forehead. It kind of looks like a third eye. And considering the fact that third eyes are an incredibly prevalent theme in the Naruto universe, and Hashirama is the only person to ever have a third eye symbology not tied to a ten tails or a divine tree, kind of makes it a little bit suspicious. Because, like I said, the only other people in Naruto's history who had a third eye were Kaguya, Three-Eyed Madara, and Hagoroma, all of whom were Ten Tails Jinchuriki. And Momoshiki. I forgot Momoshiki. Technically, he's got five eyes, but also he's eaten a lot of chakra fruits, so once again, a connection to Divine Trees and the Ten Tails. And thus, what if Hashirama's Sage Mode isn't from Earth, but is instead from the Divine Tree, whose roots grow through the entirety of the planet that Hashirama draws his energy from? Seems to make sense to me, but does it make sense to you? Tell me in the comments below, and why you guys are down there, please, for me.
like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. God, I love it when a plan comes together. And, oh, I guess it's important to add here that, no, Hashirama wasn't a Shinju, the claw grimes didn't exist, code hadn't augmented them, you know this. We made that assumption in the beginning of the video. But his presumed powers in the scenario aligned with the Shinju better than basically any other category in the entirety of the Naruto universe. So they're close. You get it. Okay, bye.